Good evening, Rabbi We're going to discuss now the Parsha Shavuot, which is Vayet Hanan. Right? Uh, so what we're doing is we are um, discussing Sefer Dvarim, the fifth book of the Chumash. So this book of the Chumash, the fifth book, Dvarim, it's really like a words of admonition. You know, it's a fancy word, whatever. What, what that means, it's like rebuke. You know, rebuke means like, you know, right, motiteva, motiteva, you know, this kind of thing, right? So, what does that mean? That uh, Moshe Rabbeinu wants to now, I'll explain to you. What that means is that Moshe Rabbeinu wants to now uh, rebuke the Jewish people the day before he dies, the last day of his life. He's telling them now, going over all the things that happened during the travails and the Midbar and then the, and the desert and the wilderness, what they did right, what they did wrong, all kinds of things. The, the, all, all the events that occurred back and forth, right, going through and reviewing everything, he wanted to do this as a way of, you know, the last uh, admonition, the last advice to give to the Jewish people before he leaves them, he leaves, right, goes to the, goes to the other world, that's the idea. So this is exactly what happened uh, when um, Moshe Rabbeinu admonished them over here. So uh, it really reviews a lot of things that we already mentioned. You know, some of it is like somewhat redundant, whatever. But there's also new things here to learn as well that we haven't seen before. All kinds of all kinds of new things. Like, it starts out like this, right? First of all, he says Moshe Rabbeinu. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, this was like a one day job. That's what it was. Yeah. So yeah. the last book is written in one day. Yes, this was a. I'm sorry. The whole book. The last. Uh, yeah, this was like a one uh, one one day job. Yeah, pretty basic. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, it was one day one day job. Yes, yeah, that's what it was. So what we're saying is like this, right? That uh, now Moshe Rabbeinu asks to to Hashem. He tells him like this. You know, one thing that I beg of you, Hashem. He goes over this. This was already done before, but this is a review. So it's telling Hashem, I was begging you to let me into Eretz Israel. You really wanted to go in there, to go into Eretz Israel. Kadosh Baruch told him. He says you can't go in. Sorry, but. Right, uh, there's no way for you to go in. So Moshe Rabbeinu, the reason they say by there something interesting, why did they really wanna? Why was he so much to wanted to go in there? What was the reason why? There was many reasons. First of all, number one, right, the simple reason is because he wants to do the mitzvot that are associated with Eretz Israel. There's all kinds of things you can do over there. The mitzvot of the land, trumot, masrot, chala, right, uh, all kinds of things like this, yovel, shmita, all kinds of mitzvot which are associated with the land. So if, he, if you don't go into Eretz Israel, by the way, those mitzvot, you're missing them. Yeah. You, you can't do those mitzvot in Chutz Laaretz and outside of the land of Israel. So Moshe Rabbeinu, for one, first of all, he wanted to take care of that issue, which is, right, to to uh, to do those mitzvot. But besides that, there was, they, also, they also said there was a different problem. There was a different issue there as well. The issue was that Moshe Rabbeinu had a personal problem that he wanted to solve as well by going into Eretz Israel. What was the personal problem? The personal problem was right, that he had some kind of an anger problem. Yeah, you know, as we find right in, in all throughout the Chumash that he got angry at the Jewish people, you know, there were things that really ticked him off, right? Uh, and this is, by the way, why he lost his right to go into Eretz Israel because of the fact that he got angry at them. This was the whole thing, right? The whole thing was triggered by the fact that he lost his temper. You know what I mean? So if that's the case, uh, he wanted to solve the problem of this anger problem that he had, this anger issue. What does that have to do with going into Eretz Israel? They say that if a person has a problem with anger, he can't control his anger, what should he do? Try to go to Israel. <laughs> right, go to Israel. Why is that? Because over there, there's a special kedushah, there's a special holiness. Not only that, by the way, besides the holiness, also there's a different issue. That uh, the Kubalim say, right, the Kabbalah says that according to the mystical, you know, approach, that when a person goes to Israel, he gets a higher level of a soul also attached to him. In other words, when you're, when you're when you're outside in the diaspora, you only have the nefesh, which is the lowest part of the soul. But there's also two higher parts as well, right? Those two higher parts are called ruach and neshama, right? So those are only available when a person goes to Eretz Israel. This is the idea, you understand? So therefore, a person has to try to go to Eretz Israel in order to, to raise his spiritual level. This is one of the reasons why. They say, by the way, also, there's no Torah like the Torah of Eretz Israel, Right? It's, learning Torah in Eretz Israel is not the same as learning outside. Not the same, not the same level. What does that mean? Once you go to a higher level, your nefesh, neshama goes to a higher level, your soul goes to a higher level, 
That Torah that you learn now is more profound, it's more strong, it's more potent, it's more powerful, it's right, it's more it's it, it affects you more, it, it changes you more, it improves you more, and also you can go to higher levels of understanding of the Torah as well in Eretz Israel. You know, I can tell you for sure from just from my vantage point, I was there for 19 years. I can attest right to this issue for sure very that that's true, that, right? very very true. Yeah, very very true. Right. Uh, so a person has to know right that the Torah of Eretz Israel is the best Torah. That's number one. So what does that mean? That Moshe Rabbeinu he wanted to go into Eretz Israel because of this reason, which is what that he wanted to fix his anger problem by going in there and really right fixing his personality, making it really right the proper the proper way. They say that uh, the, the Levi'im, uh, that Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu was a Levi, right? So Levi'im have a problem with, uh, you know, with being uh, too zealous. You know, we talked about that, right? We discussed all these things. So he also had a problem with that as well. He was a Levi, and because of that, he has a tendency. He had a tendency to overly zealous, and the over overly zealousness also brings about the anger as well. You know what I mean? That's that's the way it is, right? You start to lose your temper. You can't deal with the, with the reality of what's going on. You know, you always want things to be better, things to be higher, things to be more. Spiritually, right, uh, correct, and uh, it's not good to right, be, uh, be this kind of temper. right. That's that's the issue. Yeah, that's the, so he wanted to solve this problem by going in. So he had also a personal stake as well to go into as well by solving solving his anger problem. You know, that's number one, right? He also they say they prayed many many prayers to Kadosh Baruch Hu, 500 prayers, right? And then Kadosh Baruch Hu told them, right? We, we we talked about this. He told them stop right there. Why? Because if you do one more, I have to let you in, right? Because prayers are like you know it's like a Everyone makes a dent. So if you keep going and going, eventually it'll it'll get through. So if a person right knows that, knows the secret of the prayers, that a person has to keep going like that. He has to be vehement. He has to be adamant about the prayers. So Moshe Rabbeinu told, uh, told him, no, stop right there. I can't I can't do it. I can't let you in because why? What's the reason why? Because if you go in, you're spoiling my plans. He told him, right? What does it mean you're spoiling my plans? I don't want you to be the one to to go in and build the Beta Mikdash. I don't want you and Aaron to be the, the people who are going to lead the people. Why is that? Because if you do all these things, it's going to be too holy, it's going to be too permanent, and therefore and I'm going to be able to destroy it. When the Jews sin, I want to be able to have, have the option of destroying the Beit HaMikdash. I'd rather take out my fury on, on uh, stone and wood than take out my fury on the Jewish people. So that's why I told Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Don't go any further. That's enough. Whatever you prayed, it's enough. I don't want you to be the one to do this. You're too much on a high level. But the truth is, right, the Chazal tell us, nevertheless, even though Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to do it that time, but in the final redemption, right, he will be the one to be the final redeemer as well, right, as the, as the, as the, as the sages tell us. Hu goel harishon, hu goel acharon. He's the first redeemer, Moshe Rabbeinu is also the final redeemer. What does that mean? That really Mashiach is just an extension of the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. You know, basically, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an overflow of his soul. It's a, right, it's a it's spark of, of the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is one of a kind. You understand? There's no, nothing like him. He's, uh, you know, he's one, one, one in the world like that. Nobody else. They say, besides that, you should know that every generation that comes to this world, Moshe Rabbeinu comes back and also right gets reincarnated in every generation like that. What does that mean? That the great leaders of the generation, the great rabbis of each generation, they're a spark. They're, they're the reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what they are. Because the leaders of Am Yisrael are always coming from that soul. This is this is the idea. It's one really one one big neshama, one one big thing. So they, they always come back anyway. But nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu himself, Hakadosh Baruch Hu told him, he said, you know what? I'm sorry, but but now Moshe Rabbeinu comes over here and tells the people. He says, you know what? I also blame you because of this. Why? Because you're the one who caused me to to to, to lose my right to go into Israel. Because you you got on my case, you got me angry. I had to lose my temper. You know, I lost it. So it tells, uh, tells the Kedosh, it tells the Jewish people, you should be praying for me now, you know, that maybe the Kedosh Baruch Hu will, will change their verdicts. And I'll be able to go in. He still was, you know, trying to get a, get a, get in somehow. Yeah. The back door, side door, you know, any, any door that he could, right? He wanted to, he had such a great desire to go into Israel. He wanted to try any method, right? Any any possible way to still, to still get in. So this is the idea, right? So uh, now he tells the Jewish people, why is it, by the way, that this admonition was done on the final day of his life? There's a reason also for that. You know what they say? They say that the reason why it was done on the final day, because they say that you shouldn't rebuke people like on a daily basis or you know every every you know too often. What does that mean? Don't give them a hard time every every day. You know why did you do this? Why did you do blah, blah, blah. you know like you know you're no good. 
you know, your life is no good, you're meaningless, you know, you're not doing good in your life, blah, 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 being very, very, very harsh like that. They say if you do too much, if you go too far to write, to, to rebuke people like that, it turns them off, you know, it turns them like away from Judaism. So therefore they say, right, if you want to give somebody really a big, a big admonition like this, you know, a major rebuke, you know, fury, you know, with fury and fire and brimstone, don't do this like every every other day. It's too much. It's too uh, too powerful. This kind of thing, right? It's gonna have the wrong effect. So they say, when should a person do such a thing like this? You know when? Before the day he dies. The day before he dies is the day that he should do it. Why is that? Because now he's going away. So now they they feel sorry for him. You know they they have like empathy towards him. Sympathy, empathy. You know they feel there's the, they're in their hearts. There's a special love there, a special right this bond that, that occurs. So they say this is the day that a person should do it because now those worlds will be accepted. You know, so every person should try to do it this way. What does that mean? When he gets old, right, and he's about to, you know, go into his other world, he should call his uh, children, you know, whatever, and admonish them. What does that mean? Tell them, you know, you remember what happened over here, you remember what happened over here, you know, you got to straighten this out, you got to straighten that out. You got to, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. Don't do this every day. Give him a headache like that. You know that's the idea. Try to right. Try to try to do it just on the, on the last day. But what are we talking about over here? We're talking about a great admonition like this, right? Something which is very very major because this was major. He, you know he went through every little point of all the things that happened during the four years. So this was like you know a very scathing kind of admonition. You know very strong, very powerful. But when it comes to regular rebuke, what does that mean on a daily basis, let's say? You see your child, he does something wrong. So they say you should tell him. You know, a person should rebuke his, his children. Tell them, you know, this is not right. You know, this, uh, he has to do that. So what's the difference between this and that? We're talking, one is like a big admonition, you know, something major, you know, scathing, you know, burning, you know, and to get him on everything. It doesn't miss one point. Everything he gets him. That's too heavy to do every day on a daily basis. But when it comes to things which are occur on a daily basis, you know, things like this, uh, why did you do this? Why did you do that? This, that, don't do that, don't do this. You should do that all the time. That's something else. You know, they say that if you don't do that, if you don't, if you spare the rod of rebuke, of admonition to your child, you're, you're sending him in the wrong way. You're giving him the wrong signal, right? Everything is loud. Do whatever you feel like. No, it cannot be like that. You know, a person has to, right, has to always rebuke his children. It's a very, it's considered to be a very, very, especially nowadays, by the way. You know why? Because nowadays we don't have the issue of hitting children so much. You can't really hit your children so much today. You know, because they they rebel. Children are very rebellious today in our, in our generation. So if you give them too many, you know, too many wallops, you know, bah, 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 what happens is that they're going to start walloping you back also, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's all kinds of issues, right? Yeah, you're right. It's true. That's actually yeah. not the children's fault. It's a society's fault that allows that. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to blame. You can blame it on whatever, whoever you want, right? But the, the idea is that nowadays, right, the hitting issue is not really such a big solution in most cases. Unless, you know, the child is very small and he can handle it, you know, and he's not going to go crazy on you. He's not going to go nuclear, you know, and get some, some, I'm going to have some major reaction on it. If a person, if a child is still somewhat able to, capable of, you know, accepting that, you can still give a patch once in a while, you know, here and there, you know? But once a child is pretty much already on a on a level, that he's not going to accept your words. He's going to say, tell you, listen, who are you to tell me what to do? You know, yeah. he's, he's going to give you back right in your face. Whatever you give him, you give it right back to you, throw it right, right back at you. So they say, if, if he gets to a level like that, don't anymore hit your children, you know? Once they're going to rebel like that, the, the now the time for hitting them is over. Because, and that could be, by the way, in our generation, could be when he's five years old or ten years old. That's the way it is in our generation, you know? Children are very rebellious. So once it gets to that level, when the child will, like, you know, like, scream back at you, ah, 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 you know, or hit you back, or, you know, he'll curse you, you know, or, yeah, you know, like one of these things. If it, go, if it comes to a thing like that, they say once a child gets to this level, you're not allowed to hit him anymore. That's it, right? That's, it's over. This game is over. So then what's left for you? There's only one tool left. In your in your toolbox, the only thing is to rebuke, and even yeah, that you have to do. Way. Yeah, in a nice way. Yeah, that's the idea. You know, you have to do it in a nice way. You have to do it in a gentle way. Otherwise, right, uh, that can also have the opposite effect of what you wanted. That's the idea. What do you want to say, David? I'm sorry. Oh, I want, no, I just want to. It has nothing to do with the Torah. Yeah. I wanted to say that 
when you're living in a society yeah. that uh, condones uh, single motherhood, yeah, and, uh, oh, parents, yes, yes, it's better off that the father is not home, and those liberal judges over there sitting in court in the courts destroying families. What do you expect? That's yes, the yes, children will only take advantage of it, just like women will yeah. take advantage of, uh, you know, of yes. society. I agree with you, my friend. So, uh, I knew you would. <laughs> okay, so let's go on, right? So now it tells us also all kinds of other things here, which are very interesting. One of the one of the most interesting things that we find this in this parsha is it tells you like this, right? That a person should know that when you keep the Torah, because there are people who are embarrassed by these things. What does that mean? When they go in front of the goyim and then in front of the non-Jews, they try to like hide their culture. You know, they're they're embarrassed, you know, to show it to them in public, in public to show them about our religion, about this. You know, they say, well, you know, at home I'll be I'll be Jewish, but when I go out, I'll be like everybody else. You know, this was the this was the philosophy of the Reform Jews in Germany. You know, they said, right, when you're home, be a Jew. When you go outside, you know, be a German. That's that's what it is. About 50-50, right? One foot over here, one foot over there. <laughs> you know, that's not the way it is. You got to be also Jewish when you're outside. What does that mean? You got to look like a Jew, number one. You know, you shouldn't look like everybody else. Something should identify you as a Jew. If you don't do that, you know what happens, right? If you don't identify, you know who will? They will. Right? They will tell you, you dirty Jew, right? That's what they'll tell you. Yeah, they will. You know what? You know why that is? Because if Hakadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like when Jews don't identify themselves. So he punishes them by, by what? That the, the goyim should identify themselves. Put it put us on your on your on your arm, right? Put a tattoo on your arm. It says Jude, right? Jude. Well, why why did they do that? Because they didn't want to identify themselves. So if, if you don't do it, eventually they will do it. That's the idea, you know? So a person has to know that it's, it's a very important thing to identify yourself as, as a as a Jew. But besides that, there's also another element, which is that what? That a person also has to know, don't be embarrassed. To talk and act, your act out your religion, your culture in public. You have to, you have to, you know, you have to be strong enough to do that. I remember when I was a kid, you know, they used to, uh, they used to tell me, some people, you know, oh yeah, don't go outside, you know, like uh, don't show them your tefillin, don't show them your talit, you know, these uh, don't show the, you know, these these Christians, you know, don't show it to them, you know, like uh, some kind of, uh, you know, like you're afraid, you're scared. Is this the truth, by the way? The truth is, this is the, the worst thing a person can do to hide these things, right? You have, to, you have to, you have to be do it in the open and be proud of it. And not only that, by the way, that a person has to be pride and pride, proud and do it in the open, but also it, it tells us in the Torah that if a person will do that, he'll be proud of it and he'll discuss it and he'll talk about it. What happens is that the goyim will also admit to you that your religion is the best and your ways are the best because they recognize the wisdom, you know, of the Torah. They see the great wisdom of the Torah. Everybody is capable of recognizing the great wisdom of the Torah. Everybody. No, every human being. So therefore, if you're not embarrassed to do it, and you go out and you do it, so the guy will say, oh, you know, you have, you people have the wisest people. You're the right, greatest religion, the wisest religion. And that's the, and when they see all the logic, all the greatness of the Torah, all the holiness of the Torah, they will admit, they will be the first ones to admit that, you're, that this is the best. This is the idea, you know? When you try to hide it and, you know, like try to like weasel around, you know, yeah. as if like, yeah, yeah. are you Jewish? Ah, what does it mean? Different, what, what difference does it make? You know, what do you mean? What difference does it make? Tell me, you're Jewish. What are you afraid of? What, uh, what, what are you afraid of? What, uh, well, you know, is, yeah? those Jewish questions, Rabbi, are really sometimes insulting. You know, people are inquisitive for the wrong reason. It shouldn't be though. You should understand the guy. You see, the guy, he yeah. he uh, he comes and you know what it is. He looks he looks for, as a, for a weak spot in you. If he sees that you're not proud of your heritage, he, he identifies as a weak spot. And he'll go in and attack you. Yeah. You understand? That's the idea. When a guy identifies us that you're you're a flimsy Jew, you know, you don't have the you don't have the pride, you don't have the right, you don't have the, the you don't have the, the, the confidence that you should have yeah. as a as a Jew, he identifies you as a as a victim, you know, he'll victimize you. Yeah. That's what not it is. That. That's that's what they do, not believe me. You know, it's it's uh right. So the the, the way to avoid this is to be proud of your religion. Right? You have to be proud and and talk about it in the open and don't be embarrassed, don't be afraid. Tell them the truth. Because the Torah is the ultimate truth, you know? There's nothing to, we have nothing to hide. All the Torah is God, the Word of God. We have nothing to hide from it. You know? Makes sense to you, doesn't make sense to you, you know, whatever it is. So the truth is, you know, that once once the, the, the goyim, 
really see the greatness of the Torah, and they see the Jews are keeping it, they respect us for that. When they see that Jews are not keeping it, hiding it, you know, and, and shy, you know, uh, bashful, ee, they tell you, what happened? You're a Jew. You know, what happened, Jew? What, you're, you're, you're not proud of yourself who you are? What's with you? You know, you're flimsy. That's not good. You know, you got to be proud of who you are. you got to be proud of what you are. So the only way to to uh, right to, to, to combat that is, is to really to that's what David Amelach says by the way in Tehillim. He says that what when he used to go to the kings, you know, to to have meetings with all the other kings, the other nations, right? They would get together, you know, this conference, that conference, right? G7, G8, right? G20, G60, whatever it is. Right? All these things go over there, go over there. So what would he say? What would he talk about over there when he went there? He would talk about what Plato and Aristotle? No, he would talk about. Uh, Right, uh, he would talk about Torah and Mitzvot, you know, Halakha, you know, and Bible, you know, and uh, Agadah, Bidrash. That's what he was talking about. You understand? So that's what a person has to be. You know, he wasn't embarrassed. He said, you know, I, 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 I tell over the, the, the laws, our laws, to, to the Goyim, the Goyish kings, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed. I'm proud of it to tell them how our culture is, how our religion is. A person has to be like that. You understand? That's that's all idea. So David Amelech was the epitome of that. Right? They used to go and not, you know, like fake it, you know, and talk, you know, and pretend like he's like, like everybody else. You know, this kind of confusion, you know, culture confusion. You know what I mean? This bashfulness, those kinds of stuff, right? You have to be proud of who you are. You have to be proud of what you are. That's the idea. Okay, you got you got the idea, Rabbi Let's go on a little bit. Uh, also here, it tells us, right, it warns us regarding the issue of making idols, right? Uh, what does that mean? Not to make all kinds of physical shapes, and images, right, which can be uh, idolatrous. So a person has to be careful not to make any kind of, uh, right, uh, molten image like that, whatever, all kinds of things, uh, because these things are idolatrous, these kinds of things. So a person has to, uh, we have also admonition not to make them. And also we have, pro- right, right, yeah. Uh, all these kinds of things, whether it's uh, some shapes from the sea, from the sky, the sun, the moon, right, all kinds of constellations, all kinds of things like this. And a person is also not allowed, by the way, to believe in these kinds of things as well. You know, a Jew should not rely on these things, you know, constellations and believe in them and whatever, because the Jewish people are above the mazal. So whatever the, your mazal tells you, right, about this and that, all kinds of things, you know, you're going to be like this, you're going to be about that. It doesn't apply to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are above mazal. As we said, right, there are certain things which are under the control of the mazal. There are several things, right, three things. They are under control of the mazal. But in general, the Jewish people are above the mazal. So therefore, we don't need to now get into all these mazal, you know, constellations and fortune and all kinds of things like this. We don't need to get into all these things. That's for the goyim, right? The goyim, uh, this is what Akadosh Baruch Hu told to Abraham Avinu. When he brought him close to the Torah, he brought him close to, 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 to the Shekhinah, he told him, he said, you know what? He told him, you are, Abraham, you're very, you're expert in, um, in uh, the constellations, you're very expert in the fortune, mazalot, all kinds of things. He says, but I want you now to leave that. Leave it alone, you know. Even though you, you learn these things, you study them, all right, very carefully and all these kinds of things, now you're becoming a Jew, you're getting brit milah, right, you're, you're, you're converting into Judaism. That's it, you know, once you do that, you're above all that stuff. So you don't have to worry about it. They say, by the way, also regarding, there are certain kinds of things like eclipse, you know, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, right, these kinds of things. So the truth is, right, the Chazal say that the solar eclipse is a bad sign for the Goyim, and the lunar eclipse is a bad sign for the Jews. Right? That, that's the idea. Why is that, by the way? Because the Goyim go according to the calendar of the sun. So that represents them. We go according to the lunar calendar. So that represents us. So whichever one of those right, gets eclipsed, it's a bad sign for those people who go according to that calendar. That's the idea. you know. But nevertheless, it says in Gemara, in Masechet Tani, it says over there that the Jews don't have to worry about that. You know why? Because if they're keeping the Torah and Mitzvot, even though there's all kinds of signs and constellations, it's not going to affect them. It only affects you when, when you're not keeping the Torah mitzvot, right? When you're, well, that's, that's the idea. So you're living like, if you're living like a guy, so then it will affect you, right? That's the idea. That's the, that's the, that's the whole idea. Because now the mazal has a power over, over people who are living like, like a guy. So there are certain things, you know, that a person can do that throws him out from Am Yisrael. You know, it ejects him out. So if he got ejected, now he's living like a guy, you know, so then it will affect him. That's the idea. But the Jewish people are keeping the Torah mitzvot. They're above the mazal, so therefore they don't need to worry about all these things, right, regarding the constellations, and all kinds of things like this. Uh, okay, let's continue a little bit. 
I want to tell you also there's the Ten Commandments over here, right? Again, this was said over, even though it was already said in Parashat Itro one time. Again, it's repeated again in Vayit Hanan. So the question is, why do we need to say the Ten Commandments twice? But as we said, right, Moshe Rabbeinu was not going over, right, all these things. He's doing a repetition of all these things. He's doing admonition. So therefore, he's going over Ten Commandments as well to review it. But the truth is that we learn over here some things about Ten Commandments which we didn't learn the first time. Right? There are certain things which were filled in. The gaps were filled over here. Right? That's the idea. So one of the things is that over there, it says in the, in, the, in, the, in the first time, in Parshat Yitro, it says, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat. Remember the Sabbath day. Right? Over there, over here, it says, Shamor et Yom HaShabbat. Two different words, right? What does it mean? Zachor means to remember, and Shamor means to keep. That's the idea. So what's the difference between this and that? That Zachor is a positive. When a person right is told to Zachor to remember Shabbat, how do you remember Shabbat? How do you remember it? By making Kiddush. You mention the Shabbat, you you write, you make a, 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 a cup of wine, also in the tefillah, and in prayers also we do Kiddush as well. So but you remember Shabbat by doing Kiddush, by, by sanctifying Shabbat. Also when he does Havdalah, when he does Havdalah in the end, that's also a form of, of, of sanctification of Shabbat. All these things, you remember when it comes in, you remember when it goes out, that's the idea, right? So here also, the idea is it's telling you both ways, that what? There's two, two different elements of Shabbat. One is to remember, and the other one is to keep, right? To, to keep. What is Remembering is a positive thing, to do, make Kiddush, to sanctify Shabbat by wearing nice clothing on Shabbat, right? Not wearing everyday Monday mundane clothing. But to sanctify Shabbat the way you dress, the way you eat also, right? Everything has to be changed. It says in the Zohar Kadosh that when a person, in order to really do Shabbat properly, he has to do three things, a person, right? Uh, three elements are involved with that. Number, and that's how he changes the Shabbat from the regular weekday. One is he has to change his place. Place, place right? What does that mean? Uh, interesting, right? Interesting idea. A person should change his place on Shabbat. What does that mean? That if you usually eat on a kitchen table, go now to a dining room table, you know, on a, on a fancy place. Change your location. Go to the dining room. Don't eat over there in the kitchen, you know, where all the smoke is and all the stuff over there, right? Uh, you, you, know. you eat all the time mm-hmm. in the kitchen, you go to it. In the dining room, in the Shabbat, you can go to the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of a problem, right? You know the truth is, to be honest with you, something interesting about that, right? Yeah. This is not halakha, what I'm telling you, by the way. This is not halakha. This is just, you know... You go better, better, right, right. It's, nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the idea. But changing your place is, is a part of designating, remembering Shabbat. You know, that's something special. That's the idea. How far does this go, by the way? I'm not even talking about halakha. This is not chasidut. This is like, you know, more than halakha. Right? This is saintliness. But the truth is, you know, they say in the family of Ben Yishchayel Shalom, who was one of the great rabbis of Iraq, right, and from Baghdad, about 100 years ago. So it says over there that uh, the Ben Yishchayel, his family, what they used to do is they had a special house that they had for Shabbat. You know, it was a wealthy family, you know, so not everybody can afford that. You know what I mean? To have a special home for Shabbat. So what they did was they had a special home for Shabbat. So that's a really like a change of location, right? That's the idea. This is chasidut. But the, the idea, you know, is brought through over here. What does that mean? That Shabbat has to be special. You have to make it different than the weekday. Everything has to be different. The way you dress, the way, right? So this is also by changing your location. So if you can't afford that, what should you do? As we said, right? Change your room. Go into a different room. That's one way to do it. Right? There's also the issue of what? There's also the issue of... Uh, of putting a tablecloth, you know, usually don't have a tablecloth, now put a tablecloth, this is also a change, right? So you're making all these kinds of changes in Shabbat in order to sanctify Shabbat, that's the idea. So the, the issue of remembering Shabbat is also to change your place. Also, you have to change the name, right, of, of the day. What does that mean? By making Kiddush, right, Yom HaShishi Vayichulot, right, Mekadesh HaShabbat, Baruch Atah Hashem, Mekadesh HaShabbat, right? So what does that mean? You're proclaiming that this day is not a regular day, it's Shabbat. So you're changing the name of the day, right? So we said, right? There's two, 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 two changes. One is your location, and then also changing the name. Right? What is the third one? You have to change your deeds, also your behavior. That's the idea, right? How do you change your behavior? By having number more one, nice, right? More, exactly. Having having more special meals. You know, you don't eat a regular meal on Shabbat, right? If you usually have on Shabbat, let's say, you have, let's say you have a week a weekdays. You usually have two courses, right? Let's say you have appetizer, you know, some salads, and you eat meat. 
So on Shabbat, you should also add some another course, right? At least. What does that mean? Add soup or fish or something. You understand? You know that, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> That's the idea, right? So they say on Shabbat, a person should have at least two cooked dishes, two cooked items, at least. That's minimum. Right? People, you know, I should actually have a lot more, right? There's all kinds of customs. Some people have, like, you know... <laughs> you know, some people have, like... By, by the Sephardim, by the way, there's a custom, you know, to have, like, many salatim, also salads, you know, like 20 salads, 30 salads, you know, they bring... All kinds of delicious things. You taste a little bit of that, taste a little bit of this. Everything that will take, take, take a taste. So this also, you're changing your deeds as well. It's a different kind of a action. It's a different kind of a behavior. That's the idea, you know? So if a person does all these things, he does special meals. Right? Also, on, on a regular day, in the old days, by the way, they used to have only two meals a day. Now they have, okay, three, let's say, right? Whatever. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But they also, the fact that you're adding one more meal by having three meals, right, also change. It's also a change in the way you behave. Even though the truth is, right, in the afternoon, when you eat your third meal on Shabbat, you're not really hungry, you know, so much. You know, you're full from the, the morning meal, right? You're stuffed like, you know, like a parachod, you know? Gas, 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 you know? That's the idea. You're stuffed right in the, in the, from the morning, but still you're eating another one. Why? Not because you're hungry, because you want to honor Shabbat. You know? It's kavod. That's, that's the idea, you know? So that's the sheet. Yeah, that's the idea, right? So when you have a third meal, that shows that you're, you're also changing your behavior. Why? Because usually you won't eat until you're hungry. Now you're not really hungry. You won't be hungry till the night, let's say, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Then, then you right. still have to, eat you have to do Mala Matka, right? That's also another thing, right? That's also true. But the point is, right, that you're, so you're changing three things over here. So when a person does that, he changes all these three things, he's really making Shabbat special. So this is from the, this is from the positive side. Zachor, remember Shabbat. But now we're talking about Shamor, right? Two, this, is, this is a different element of Shabbat. So what is Shamor? Shamor means to guard the Shabbat, to keep Shabbat. How do you guard the Shabbat? How do you keep Shabbat? By refraining from doing the forbidden labors on Shabbat, right? How many labors are there on Shabbat? 39 labors, right? Basic basic labors. But these 39 labors, basic labors, have many subcategories as well. You know what I mean? It gets divided up into different subcategories. Each one has like, let's say, 10 or 5 or some have three, some have this. So a person has to study these things, you know. As it says in the Mishnah Barua, right, brought down, that a person who doesn't learn the laws of Shabbat, for sure he's breaking Shabbat, there's no question why. Because if you don't know the laws of Shabbat, how are you going to keep it, you know? The laws of Shabbat are so complicated, right? It says in the Gemara that the laws of Shabbat are numerous. Right, it says, right, what does that mean? That the laws of Shabbat are very numerous. So therefore a person, if he really wants to keep Shabbat, the only way is to study the laws of Shabbat. Let me ask you a question, right? How long does it take to, to, to learn the laws of Shabbat? You know how long it takes? Let's say average, right? About two, three years, minimum. Two, three years? Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's very complicated, you know? Quite complicated. So what does that mean? That a person has to start sometime in his life. And by the way, I hate to, I hate, I hate to say this, you know, but this is one of the criticisms that I give to the, the, the shul over here. Which is what they're not learning enough halacha over here, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a forgotten, it's a forgotten, you know, our art over here. Only agadot, agadot, only stories, you know. Tell me stories, you know. Tell me another story, you know. You know, zhazaprev, you know, it's kaskev, you know. That's not so good. Okay, good. It's good, you know. They're true these stories, but a person has to also devote himself to halacha as well. They say, by the way, it says in the Surah Kadosh that if a person doesn't keep halacha, no matter how religious he is or devout, you know, or you know, datini, you know, whatever, it's not going to help him anyway. You know, that much. Why is that? Because he's going to fall into the klipot. What does that mean? He's going to fall into the impurity. If a person doesn't know how to do everything the proper way, you know what I mean? What happens is that Kadosh Baruch Hu, you know why he gave us halacha? What's the reason why? The truth is, right, halacha seems to be something cumbersome. You know, very difficult. You know, like not so interesting, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like a headache, whatever. You know, whatever. So, like, people don't want to get into this stuff. You know, they're not really interested. Mm-hmm. And this is the whole idea, by the way, you know, behind this, this thing. That they say, right, that we talked about this before with Jimmy, whatever. We talked about this issue that when the Jews got the Torah, as we're talking about here, right, the Ten Commandments, they got the Torah and the Ten Commandments. So you know what the problem was, right? They only, they really only accepted the, the written Torah. The oral Torah, they didn't really want to accept with a full heart. You know what I mean? Why is that? Because the oral Torah is very cumbersome. It's very difficult to learn the halachot, all the intricacies of the halacha, all these things, you understand? All, all these issues. So uh, a person has to, right... To, to devote himself to that, the only way they really, they, they say, right, the Kadosh Baruch Hu forced them to accept it. By hanging the mountain over their head, right, he said, you know, if you don't keep it, if you don't accept it, I'll bury you right here, right? This is going to be your your uh, your uh, your burial ground. 
But that's the idea. Please include some alakot the new ones. Maybe we don't know that we can right. include them more. So the thing is, right, that a person, there has to be in, in, the, in the shul, in the Bet Knesset, every shul, every yeshiva especially, it also has to have, uh, you know, classes in halakha. Where people are learning halakha in a systematic manner. Otherwise, you know, when are you going to start? When are you going to finish? You know, it's a long, to learn the Shulchan Ruch, let's say, right, from cover to cover. There's four different sections. There's different volumes there. How long does it take? You know how long it takes to read the Shulchan Ruch? About 20 years. That was close. 25 years, you know, to learn it really, really good. It's really a big, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big job. You know, so a person has to start. They say that um, there was, you know, also in, in, the, in the, there's also other communities that have also have this problem. That they learn too much only Gemara, you know. They concentrate only on Gemara. The Gemara is really it's really halakha. But the problem is that when you learn the Gemara, you have to go till the end and get to the halakha as well. What does that mean? Just don't do everything in theory, you know. This one says like this. This one says like that. It's not enough just to know the, what the Gemara says. You also have to get to the conclusion of the Gemara. And that's the halakha, you know. The conclusion, the final verdict, which is brought down in the poskim, in the Rishonim and the Achronim, the Shulchan You got to also read these the, these things. So a person has to systematically, you know, get, cover all that stuff. They say, right, that there was one Rosh Shiva, you know, the Ashkenazi, you know, the Ashkenazi world also, they like to learn Gemara, they like to learn a lot of Gemara, you know. But it, it's some, Halakha is not, not emphasized so much, you know, some, somewhat, you know, also in their world as well. But so what happens is like this, right, that um, regarding the Halakha, the, the one, one rabbi told me, the chief rabbi of Israel, he told us, you know, there was one Rosh Shiva, you know, who's like the head of the Yeshiva, so they say that he started to learn Bet Yosef, you know, which is considered to be like the main body of Halakha. In, in Halakha, Bet Yosef, he started to learn it when he was 70 years old. You know, besides, before that he was learning Gemara and Talmud, you know, uh, and all other things. Now when you are 70 years old, you start to learn, you know, so when are you going to finish? When you're in Kupo you know? When are you going to, you know, what, what, so it's a little bit too late to start when you're 70, you know what I mean? You know, excuse my, you know, but you got to start when you're young, you know, if you start when you're young, you have a chance to do something, get something, get something done. They say, by the way, the halakha says, it says in the Khatam Sofer, brought down Khatam Sofer, that it says that if a person only has three hours a day to learn Torah, he should learn only halakha. You know why? Because it takes so much time to cover all the bases in halakha, to cover all the details. Right? It, so you gotta, if you don't do three hours a day, you have no chance to get it done. That's the idea. So getting back to what we said over time, that a person has to keep these 39 labors, all these things, all the details that are involved in there. And this is called shamor. So Shabbat has two elements, right? It's got the positive element, it's got the negative element as well, right? So the question is like this, right? When HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually said the Ten Commandments, which one did he say? Did he say Zachor or did he say Shamor? Because over there in Parshat Yitro, it says Zachor. Over here it says Shamor. So which one is the true one? They're what? One of them is wrong? So you know what they say, right? The Chazal, they say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said both of them at the same time. He said Shamor and Zachor. People cannot do that, right? Unless you're a ventriloquist, right? <laughs> you, can, you can do something like that. Like, can say two words at one time. You know, at the same time. You understand? So, Gadash Baruch said both of them at the same time. When they heard, they heard Shamor and Zachor in one second. Both of them together. That's the idea, you know? <laughs> Dual personality, right? Dual personality. Schizophrenia, right? Whatever. The truth is that there's no schizophrenia. You know why? Because really, it's all one It's all one body. It's one, you know, it's one... Uh, that's, that's the idea, right? So, yeah. We're trying our best, you know, what can I do, you know, our, to our, according to our limited, you know, ability, our limited knowledge, you know, whatever we can do. Right? Do you teach anybody yeah. on a here in the United States? We, we have to, you know, we, that's what we're doing on Thursday. On Thursday, we're, we're concentrating more on halakha. Some, some other places? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're also doing uh, in the Bukharian shuls over here in some places. We're doing, you know, whatever we can do. Also, I do videos, you know, I do, from home also, I do some videos on halakha. I just did one to, uh, yesterday. I try to do one, like, you know, regularly, all the time, halakha, videos, all kinds of things. Also, we do over here. I mean, between Mincha and Arvit, I, when I when I go up to say something, I say something. Like yesterday, we, you, were, you were here, right? Yesterday, you were here. So we try to do it like this way. A person has to know, you know, the halakha is considered to be a very, very prime. You know why? Because if a person doesn't keep halakha, says the Kadosh says, even though you may be very religious and very holy, but you're going to still fall into the into the klipa. You know, You know, that's that's the way it is. You notice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is how much halakha the Georgian people know and remember. <laughs> you notice for the past 40 years, yeah. every Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, we ask the same stupid questions to the rabbi. <laughs> you know, went to Lashar. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
know? Yeah, but now the truth is, to be honest with you, that even even that they're not asking anymore. I don't even hear anything about it. Oh, you know? maybe they find. I mean, I don't hear nothing. You know, maybe nobody's asking, nobody's answering, nobody. I don't see nothing going on. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, it's becoming you know a lost we are art over here. To the way we are you know? you know, but the truth is that in the beginning when the show started out, it was a little bit more. Yeah, now it's even less, you know? Yeah, it's even less. You know, it's gotten even more sparse. You know, but that has to come back, of, of course. But the truth is, you know, that they say, as we said, the Zohar Kadosh, you have to explain, have to explain to you what that means. That if a person doesn't keep the halakha, you know what it is? This world was corrupted. What does that mean? That when Adam Rishon did the f- sin, like the first man, he did the sin, the initial sin. So what happened was that the world now fell down into a very depraved state. So in order to, to avoid all the impurity of the world, the only way to rise above it and avoid that is to keep your halakha. That's what, that's what the Zohar Kadosh says. So if a person wants to avoid falling into the pitfalls of, of life, the only way to really avoid it is to, to, to follow the halakha in every situation. So a person has to know in every situation what to do, you know? If you don't know, you got to ask a rabbi. Somebody who knows something in halakha, you know? Somebody who knows something, you got to ask him. Otherwise, if a person doesn't have, or a rabbi, or he doesn't know himself, so he's going to make a lot of mistakes in life. You know what I mean? Well, this is the idea. I'm sorry? Everything happened that we got kicked out because of one word. When which which him, word? Hashem told him, don't eat from this tree. Right, he once said, yeah, one sin. Don't, don't eat and don't touch. Yeah, but the he truth... Is, oh, oh, now you came to a good point, right? We need to yeah, talk, we, we, we got to talk about that. I was, I was trying to talk about it, you reminded me. Do you think me. it's fair yeah, that yeah. 8 billion people have to suffer because some <laughs> schmuck ate an But you know, you know what it is? It's interesting, don't right? Don't about my forefathers. <laughs> <laughs> Babu watching, Babu. Babu watching is Babu watching. <laughs> By the way, does uh, Adam fall into Asaph's uh, family or? Uh... Adam Arishon, all the Neshamot came out from him. He was he was a big guy, you know. Everybody comes from him. I see. You know what I mean? He was like the big hancho, the, the forefather, you know, the godfather, you know. He, everybody everybody's Neshama comes from him. You know that's the. <laughs> no, I mean some guy eats an apple and. Uh... You made a laugh. <laughs> that's good. He got a good laugh out of it. He said the wrong word. He said, "Don't eat and don't touch." Why the hell you say don't touch? So, so the idea, you know, but you should know, by the way, I want to tell you, right, regarding this question that you guys are asking, that the really, right, even though this came about, like, by way of a sin, you know what I mean? But this was God's plan also, that it should come out like that. He wanted that. You know what I'm saying? The whole point was that we should fall, right, that's the idea, you know, that's the idea, that's the idea. So what does that mean? Like, those people who wanted that we should fall into that, in that gutter, right, into the pit, and then and have the merit to climb out by our own Merits, right? Our, our own effort. That's the idea, so you know? This like is the, the idea. Same, uh, thing that, uh, the Clintons did just now. They couldn't stay upstairs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know about that. Everything is a conspiracy. <laughs> I don't know. Even the. But, but the idea is like this, right? That Hakadosh Baruch Hu, you know why? Because he wants to reward us. And he doesn't, Hakadosh Baruch Hu doesn't give a free lunch. He doesn't give free lunches to people. He gives you on, on, on deserving on your merit. So therefore, he wants you to earn your olam haba. He so wants he to give wanted, you something really, really good. Adam to work for me, Adam. He didn't want to do so the idea is like this, right? That we, 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 we Baruch Hu wants to give us our due reward in the world to come by earning it, by doing Torah and mitzvot, by keeping all the details of the halacha. A person gets rewarded on every little thing, you know. So that's why it says, right, in the Mishnah, what does it say, right? We read this all the time, every every day we read, right? Rabbi Chanina Mekashomer, that's Hakadosh Baruch Hu has got Israel. What does this mean, this Mishnah? We read it all the time, right? No right, nobody explains it, right? <laughs> what does it mean, this, right? So it says, Hu wanted, Hu He wanted to give merit to the Jewish people, and therefore gave them many Torah and Mitzvot, many details of Halakha. Keep this, keep that, keep that. Why? Because every little thing that you do, he's giving a reward for that. And you don't know what you're getting rewarded for, by the way. How much for here, how much for that. It could, it could be that for something small, you're getting rewarded very greatly. You know what I mean? So we don't know what the reward is for each mitzvah. We don't know what the reward is for each halacha. So therefore, Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to, you know what? Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give us like a, like a smorgasbord, you know? Like a big buffet. You know, everything. Take everything, you know? Just do what I tell you. The more you do, the more you get. You know, that's the idea. But you know, when it comes to the Goim, he, he didn't give them all that. You know why? Because they rejected the Torah. He doesn't care about them. You know? Let them, you know, let them be to themselves. He doesn't care about them. But since the Jewish people, you know, said, Nasev and Ishma, we'll take it, you know, give it to us. Yeah, let's go. You know, the Jewish people have that chutzpah, you know, that 
they go for it. They're, going, they're way more scaredy cats, you know. They say, hey, hey, hey. You know, that's the idea. But the Jews are tough people. You know, they're they're they're. They're, 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 they're yeah. just uh, reject the reason. They didn't want yeah. to. They, 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 they didn't want to keep them as well. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. You know, same idea. You know. So the right, the, the, the Jews, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you know what? Since you are my chosen people, like it says over here in the Chumash, we find that since you are my chosen people, I want to give you as much as I can. You know, I want to give you a truckloads of, of rewards. So I'm giving you truckloads of mitzvot also. You know. Keep going, keep learning, keep studying, keep going, right? All these kinds of things. So this is the idea, right, behind the issue of uh, Shamor and Zachor. They're a person also keeping Halakha. It's considered to be the most important thing. Why? But the truth is, right, that before Adam HaRishon sinned, we didn't need all these things. You know why? Because the world was so elevated, a person didn't, there was nowhere to fall. You know, so he didn't need to keep Halakha so much. That's why Kedosh Baruch Hu gave the Amad HaRishon, how many, how, many, how many mitzvot did he give him? Just one. He told him, just keep one mitzvah. That's all I tell you. Everything else, do whatever you want. Do whatever you feel like. You know why? Because that Gan Eden that he was living in, the Garden of Eden, there was nowhere to fall. You know, everything was elevated. So therefore, we didn't need to, to keep all the mitzvah. But we need to elevate ourselves in this dirty world, this filthy world, by keeping the halachot, you know, keeping the, the details of the mitzvah. So therefore, a person, in order to elevate himself from the garbage, that the gutter that, that is in this world, is by elevating himself, right? All the other going, they say, you know, I can't change. You know, that's the way I was born. You know, I was born a gambler. I was born a thief. I was born a murderer. You know, I was born a right, adulterer. You know, I was born a homo, right? They, they all say right now, they say, right? I was born a girl. I'm a boy, but I was born a girl. I, I'm a girl, but I was born a boy. What do you mean you were born a boy? What is, what is it talking about? You were born what you were born. No, what do you, what do you, do? you know why? Because a goy, that's, his, that's the way, I can't change, he says. You know, I can't change myself. Whatever I am, that's the way I'm going to die. You know, that's it. I can't, I can't change. And the Jew says, no, give me the Torah, give me, I'll take it. I'll change myself. That's the idea, understand? This is a different step of an approach between the Goy and the Jew. The Goy just says, you know what, let me just get through life, you know, get, get through and finish it off, do the best I can, and that's it, you know? But I'm not going to make any major, you know, changes or alterations, I can't. That's the way I was born. Right, they say, they, they say to the Lord, right, they say, Lord, you know, you created me this way, you know, you created me a bum, so I'm going to remain a bum all my life. That's not the way it is, right? HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to, he wants you to approve. That's why he gave the Jewish people so many mitzvot. The goyim, he doesn't care about them so much, you know? So he leaves, leaves them to the side. They say, you know what, you don't want my Torah, you don't want my mitzvot, go and t- and, you know, take take care of yourself. What, what is it, you know, why he leaves them on automatic pilot? What does that mean? That they are they are really, the goyim, are are controlled, the, the, right, the Kadosh Baruch Hu gives them their mazal, their destiny, Right, their reward through the constellations. He doesn't personally, you know, monitor them on a, on a right on a very minute basis like he does us. But by us, everything is monitored, everything is regulated by him personally, not by the mazalot and all kinds of things like this. He personally watches over us. You know, he's a real father. We're a real son. He's a real father. You know what I mean? He he watches out for us. Everything, every little detail. The guy tells him, you know what? Go to your mazalot. Go to your horoscope. Right. You're a Virgo, you're a Leo, you're a Bango, Bango, you're a Django, whatever it is you are, right? You're this, uh, who cares about you? You don't want my Torah, I don't want you. But the Jewish people tell them, no. I'll give you everything, all the mitzvot, all the halakha, all this, you know? So, regarding what Jimmy talked about, right? What, is, what was it you mentioned there? I'm going to remember that, right? 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 The, the what? You, no, you, you talked about the issue of... Um, you mentioned the, the issue of... Okay, I remember, if you, if you recall, there was something you mentioned about that. What was Adam that? The, what, what, what about that? Yeah, that he told Chava don't eat. And ah, don't okay, eat. right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I if want to get into this. Because it's also part of this parsha as well. You know why? Because the Torah teaches us over here is also different. Don't elements. add any words. That's the idea, right? Don't, not to add any words. Don't add any mitzvot to the Torah. Bal tosif, right? Don't add to something that I gave you. What does that mean? The worst thing that a person can do, by the way, either way, right, is to add, for, to, add to the Torah or to subtract from the Torah something. You know, like the Goyim do. You know, they say, this doesn't apply anymore. This doesn't apply anymore. You know, now this guy came and changed everything, you know. Yeah, what changed everything? Yeah. You know, you, you, you changed yourself, you know. You're trying to hide and tr- trying to live in a lie. You're living a lie. What changed? Nothing changed. You know, there's no New Testament. There's a No Testament. They have No Testament. What? There's, a, there's nothing new. And Hadash Tachatashamash. You know, that's what Shemar says, right? There's nothing new under the sun. Every, everything is the same. Nothing has changed. And if you think that Kadosh Baruch will change the world, right, he's just going to ignore you, like, you know, you don't exist. Just like you think the Torah doesn't exist, he's going to say, you know, you say my Torah doesn't exist, 
The mitzvot don't exist anymore. I say you don't exist. You know, I don't care about you. You know, go to your, go to your, uh, you know, go to your way and do what you want to do. It's not my business. So the idea is like this, right? That Kadosh Baruch Hu tells us, don't add to the Torah, don't add to the mitzvot. Why is that? Because the Torah is something perfect, you know. It's not some kind of like a haphazard religion that was made up by some crazy, you know, homosexual priests, you know, child molesters, like their their religion. You know? And also, you know, their this this Muhammad, you know, this crazy lunatic, you know, who was he killed Jews, you know, he beheaded beheaded Jews, six hundred Jews. He personally killed with his own hands. This is Rasha, you know, in Machshim of You know, these were both sinners. These people, you know, they're this one, this one. They're both sinners and you know heretics. You know, you know that's that's the idea. So Kadesh Baruch Hu tells you, tells you, don't be like them. Don't add anything to the Torah. Don't subtract anything. Whatever I, whatever I gave you, that's what you should, you got to keep. And you shouldn't think, by the way, oh, you know, I won't subtract, you know, because that's already like, you know, you're reducing the mitzvot. But why not to add? You know what I mean? Adding is actually good, right? Why? Because I'm doing more. I'm doing more than God wants me to do. But the Torah Baruch Hu says, you know what it tells you? Kol abosif gorea. If you add something, you're subtracting actually, right? You're taking away from the Torah. Why? Because you're putting from your own you know, minuscule mind, something additional that, that Akadosh Baruch Hu never thought of these things. Right? You're to him. Exactly. You're, you're insulting him. You're, you're, you're trying to put yourself on his level, you know, like on his on his plateau by adding something to him. That's what, therefore they say, right, when it says, when it comes about tzitzit, right, it says, how many tzitzit you have to put? Four. Right? If you're four corner garment, but don't put five. You know what I mean? That's Baltosif. You're adding one mitzvah which is not there. So a person who does that is, is transgressing the Torah. Or let's say, right, another another thing, right? Let's say a person was commanded, we're commanded to put one tefillin on the head and one tefillin on the arm, right? What about if a person puts two? So he's going on, also, he's adding to the Torah. Interesting, right? So now the, the question comes up regarding this, what about the tefillin of Rabbeinu Tam, right? We actually, right, the people who are very religious, they put two, yeah. right? They put Rashi, they put Rabbeinu Tam. So the question is, how do they do that? If you're not allowed to add to the mitzvot, how do you do it? Right? That's the idea. You know? So you know what it says in Shulchan Aruch? That if you really want to do it this way, you want to put Rashi and also Rabbeinu Tam, like the religious people do, you know, the very pious people. So it says, you know what you got to do? When you put one and then put the other, you should have in mind that one of them is the real tefillin. I don't know which one it is. I'm not sure. You know, If this is the real tefillin, this is the mitzvah. If that's the real tefillin, this is the mitzvah. And the other one, I'm just I'm putting on straps, you know, whatever. You know, putting on some uh, straps on my head, on my arm. So what does that mean? That you have to ha- have to have the kavana that they're, they're both not the mitzvah. Only one of them is the real mitzvah, but you just don't know which one. If your kavana is that to say that you're putting two tefillin and you, according to the Torah, you got to put two, this is already bal tosif. You know, you're, you're adding to the Torah. This is the idea, you know? That's why I say, right? Don't add to the Torah. Don't add anything. Because Kadosh Baruch Hu, when he tells you, this is what I want, he means only that. That's it. Don't add anymore. And don't think, right, that if you add, you're going to be like more religious, you know, and more devout. No, you're a fool. That's what it is, you know. How come they came up with the second tefillin? Because it's doubts, you know, because we're not sure which one is the right one. You know, it's like we have machloket, you know. Well, this machloket, this machloket, right? This is the question, right? How, how was it during the generations? They say, right, Moreno Rabbeinu Marana, which he told us that the truth is according to history, in the, in the time of the Geonim, right, which is over a thousand years ago. So he said, right, if you look into the manuscripts, the books that it's written, that's written in the, from those, those times, all the Geonim were putting the Tzvinah Rabbeinu Tam only. Meaning what? That they held that was the Halacha. Rabbeinu Tam is the Halacha. Even though they were before Rabbeinu Tam, these guys, right? We call it Rabbeinu Tam. Why? Because it's like, it's, his name is like famous for that. But the truth is that this opinion was even way before Rabbeinu Tam, right? Way, way before Rabbeinu Tam. Something, just as his, his name was put on this, you know? Also, the Tzvinah Rashi. It wasn't Rashi who made up this. Right? It's just that he wrote it in Talmud, so we use his name. But these two opi- opinions, right, were way, way, way before also. You know, way before. So the Geonim were putting only, only Rabbeinu Tam. That's the idea, right? So then what happened was that the Rishonim, who were after the Geonim, 1,000 years and, and uh, after that, so then what happened was that the Rambam and Rashi said, you know, they should do it a different way. They didn't agree with the Geonim. So therefore, when, what they did was they changed it. So all, most of the Rishonim, the earlier authorities, who came after the Geonim, they were putting Rashi more, right, and not Rabbeinu Tam. But the truth is, in both cases, they were not putting two tefillin, these people. Only one. Because they said, you know, this is the right one. That's it. That's all you need. You don't need any more than that. Right? That's, the, that's the idea. Which one are we putting? We're putting the Rashi, right? 
Most of us put Rashi, right? Except the ones who put two, right? Uh, most of us put Rashi. Why is that? Because the prevailing custom by most places, in most places, like Rashi, that's the idea. Why is that? Because the earlier authorities, we're talking about Rashi, the Rambam, the Ritva, the Rashba, the Meiri, right? All these big, big Rishonim, they all said like Rashi. So therefore, the, the, the prevailing custom is like Rashi. But a person who wants to fulfill, right, also the other side, as we said, he also does Rabbeinu Tam. That's the idea. That's right. But nevertheless, right, don't add to the mitzvot. Right? You know the famous story, right, which is brought down regarding Adam and Chava. This is how the snake got Chava to sin. What does that mean? Right? That Adam Arishon told to Chava, he said, you know what, let me tell you, my dear wife, Kadosh Baruch commanded us two things, right? Don't eat from this tree and also don't touch the tree. Right? So what happened was that the truth is HaKadosh Baruch Hu never said not to touch it. He just said, don't eat from it. So what happened was that the snake now came and they fooled Chava by this. What did, he, what did the snake do? He told Chava, you know, Chava told, told like the snake like this, we're not allowed to touch a tree either. So the snake told him, he says, what are you talking about? He says, no, there's no prohibition to touch a tree. So what she did was, right, she pushed him, she pushed, he pushed her, and he says, you see, nothing happened, you touch a tree. What are you talking about? Yeah, you, you people are fanatics. You know, that's the idea, right? Don't, don't get this fanatical stuff. So, uh, what happened was, right, that uh, this is how he fooled her into sinning. So this is the idea, you know? This is how he fooled her. He showed her, right? Nothing happened. So he said, just like nothing happened, when you touch a tree, also nothing will happen if you eat it as well. So you see from there that what? That, that's what the Chazal told us, right? Kolas Mosif Korea. Whoever adds to the Torah is actually taking away from the Torah. What does that mean? That if you try to do too much, you're actually going to wind up doing too little in the end. So therefore, right, then now the question is like this, right? If that's the case, Bennett, as we said, that a person shouldn't add to the Torah. So then what is this whole concept of chasidut, right? Which is what? Chasidut, the whole concept is to do more than the halacha requires you. So how does that go? How does that fit into the picture, if that's the case? Right? How can a person be a Hasid? Hasid means, I do more than the halacha. You know? So how can you do more? We just said that you shouldn't do more. Right? Baal Tosif. Don't add to the Torah. They're more stringent about whatever they have. You know what I mean? But they're adding things which are which we're not commanded to do, right? Really, apparently. So the question is, how are they doing that? So the truth is, right, that there's a book called Mesilat Yisharin by the Ramchal, one of the great Kabbalists. So he writes over there, that a person should always try to do chasidut. What, what does that mean? If he already did the regular halacha, he learned the shulchan aruch, he got to that level where he fulfilled everything, he learned everything. So now try to add, also add. You know why? Because don't just be like, right. You should have to also go up to a higher level. You know, become more angelic. You know, more saintly. You have to become. You know, don't just sit and be satisfied where you are. Also start to add now more things as well. What does that mean? Forbid to yourself things which are permitted to you. You should also do that as well. You're not obligated, but it's, you should try. So, you know, uh, but the, what, what, what he says over there, before he writes all these things, he writes something else. He's right. The Chazal told us in, in the Pirkei Avot, in Amaretz Chasid. What does that mean? Amaretz cannot be Chasid. Right? What does that mean? What's the meaning of that? You know what the meaning is? Chasid is somebody who does more than Halakha. He does more. Right? But a person who's Amaretz cannot do that. Why not? What's the reason why? Right. Why can't Amaretz do? Why? What's the reason why? You know why? Because he doesn't know how. He, he doesn't know how to do it. Enough? Right. But he doesn't know. He doesn't know how to approach this. What does that mean? That a person, in order to do Hasidut, he has to be first knowledgeable in all the areas of Torah. You know why? Because sometimes what happens is that if you add too much to the Torah, it could actually come to do a sin, as we said. Right? It can take him to the wrong direction. Because, you know, it's like a boomerang effect, you know? You want too much extreme, the boomerang, boomerang came, right, and pushed you to the other extreme, you know? Boom. Because you don't belong there. You're going into the place where you don't belong. It's too extreme for you, that place. It's too harsh for you. It's too it's too fanatical for you there, to be there. You know? So it pushes, the boomerang pushes you out. A person who's an Amaretz, he doesn't know how to, where to go to the extremes, you know, how to add, where to, where to, how to play this game, you know? It's like a chess game, you know, they have deal, you know? Like you have to know how to maneuver around. You know, in order to do chasidut. If a person doesn't have the expertise to do that, they tell him, you know, just keep the halacha, regular halacha. You know, don't be a wise guy. You know, don't try to be a hero. Because it's going to cause you to do sins. Just like Chava, it caused her to do a sin. 
So then, how does this balance out, right? It balances out like this. When should a person do chasidut, Bennett? Right? When should a person do chasidut? As we said, right? To add to the Torah, don't do that. You're doing, you're, you're, it's a sin to add to the Torah. So then when? You know when it is? Exactly what we just mentioned, right? That when we have a, when there's a machloket in the poskim, and we're not really sure which one is the halacha, you know? It could be this one is correct, it could be this one's correct. So what we do is, right, just to make sure, we, we do it both ways. Try to take care of two opinions. This is called chasidut, you understand? Chasidut means you're not sure which one is the right one, and therefore, right, you try to do it from both angles. This is the idea, you know? So a person who does this is called a chasid. You know why? Because he doesn't mean, he's not really obligated to do that. He's only obligated to do what the halacha says. What does that mean? When there's a machloket in, in the Torah, in, in, the, in, in the halacha, there's also a way to resolve the machloket. There's rules how to come up with the halacha. You know, which is the halacha? Is the halacha like this guy? Is the halacha like this guy? Right? Is it like Rashi, like Tosfot? Which is the halacha? So the halacha comes out to be according to the rules of halacha. The majority, right? There's all kinds of issues there. How to, how to, how to reconcile these things? How to come up with the proper formulate the halacha? So what happens is that a person who, who is not sure which is the halacha, it's not so clear to us. And sometimes, even if it's clear, but nevertheless, right, there's also the other side which is bothering you. You know, your your conscience is being bothered by that. If you're on the level that it bothers your conscience, these kinds of things, right? You have to be on a level for that. So then you should do chasidut. That's the idea. But but to add something which nobody said, there's no opinion like that whatsoever. You know, not this guy said this, nothing. So then what do you, this is this is called chasid shote. You know, you're idiots. You know, you're adding things. You know, you know, debilia. You know, chasid debili chasidia. What does that mean? You're adding things to the Torah which were never said by anybody. You know, just because what you feel like it. You know what I mean, this is already not. This is not a part of the Torah. You're outside, going outside the Torah already. When a person does that, you understand? This is outside the the the, um, the misgeret, right? This is outside of the system of the Torah. When a person does this, so chasidut only applies when, when you're not sure which one is the halacha. Right there, we have the issue, the, the, the issue of chasidut, and therefore, right? They say it many times. The poskim, you will you see. The, 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 the halakhic authorities, what they say is that this element over here, there's no there's no issue to chasidut in this in this thing. You know why? Because it's clear that there is no other way to do it. There's no other uh, there's no other option here. So if there is no other option according to halakha, by doing chasidut, you're you are you demonstrating you're amaretz. You know, you're you're ignorant person. Why? Well, because you don't know what you're doing. You know, and this is exactly why amaretz cannot be chasid. You know why? Because he doesn't know how to do these games. He doesn't know how to manipulate these things, you know, go back and forth. So what happens is he gets into trouble. Like Chava, you know? Chava got into trouble. So if you're Amaretz and you don't know how to do these things, what happens is that you get into trouble. This is the idea. You know, you understand? This is the idea. So therefore, Rabbatai, uh, right, the, one of the, this is one of the main elements of the Torah, Baal Tosif. Don't add to the Torah. Don't, don't subtract from the Torah. Just keep the Torah the way it is. And don't try to be a wise guy, right, and try to make all kinds of new things, you know, this uh, reform, conservative, all kinds of things, you know, to add all kinds of new concepts to the Torah, you know, this testament, that testament, who are you to bring new testament, you know, to the Torah, Torah, Torah? Well, you're trying to change the mind of God? You think you're on his, his level? You should change his mind? Right? The, the truth is, right, as the, as the, as the Zohar Kadosh teaches us, that the, the world is a blueprint of the Torah. What does that mean? The Kadosh Baruch who looked into the Torah and created the world according to, to, the, to the concepts of the Torah. So there's nothing in this world that goes outside the Torah. No such a thing like that. Everything goes according to the concepts of the Torah. So if a person knows the Torah, he really knows how the world functions. You know? He knows how the world works. But he doesn't know Torah. He's Amaretz, you know? He doesn't know how the world works. So what happens is, right? He gets into, he gets into all kinds of trouble. This is the idea. So this is the reason why, Rabbi So Also, I want to mention another issue, right? Regarding the issue of Kibbut Avem. Which is also right, the fifth commandment, right? We talked about that before, right? <laughs> the number game, right? The number game. We got into this, right? So the fifth commandment of honoring your parents, you should know that in this generation, by the way, we have special issues regarding this. You know why? Because many of us, our parents are not really religious so much. They're not observant so much, you know? So the question is like this, right? Does a person have to honor a parent who's not religious, who's not observant? This is the question, you understand? This is the question which is asked. So what's halacha bemet, right? So we find, if you look in the uh, in the Rishonim, you find two opinions over there behind this, right? You find the Rambam and the Tur. The Rambam says, if, if your father is a Rasha, Rasha Kherio, you know? What does it mean that a person is Rasha? You know what that means? Very simply, right? A person, let's say, doesn't do one of the mitzvot of the Torah, but he shaves with a razor, you know? He's Rasha Even though the other mitzvot he keeps, 
He doesn't keep one of the mitzvot. The Torah is called Rasha. That's the idea. You know, Rasha. You know why? Because he knows that it's not allowed to do that. He knows. He does it anyway. You know. It's not a matter of like you know being shogeg. You know, just being inadvertent. So now they say, right? Let's say your parent does one of these. You know, he, he keeps mitzvot, but when it comes to several things, you know, one thing he doesn't keep. He shaves with a razor. You know, uh, let's say, or he uh, he eats. You know, not kosher meat, right? Nevelot, uh, trefot. You know, whatever. He eats all kinds of stuff like that. He's a rasha. He knows that it's not allowed to eat these things. He eats them anyway. He eats lobsters. He eats he shrimps. You know, he right? He knows. He doesn't keep. You know, he doesn't keep it. So the Rambam says, nevertheless, you're still required to honor your your father, even if he's a rasha. Father and mother. Yes, same thing. Same, same thing. Right? They're all equal equal footing. Right? That's the idea. So the question is now, what about if, if uh, right? Um, okay, that's fine. But now the tour comes and says, doesn't agree with that. Right? What is the reason of the Rambam, first of all? Right? I want to explain to you. The Rambam says that even though now he's a rasha, but maybe one day he's going to do tshuva. You know, the tshuva is the You know how it is, right? When people get older, they start to come back to Judaism, right? All kinds of things like this. So what happens is, right, that uh, therefore the Rambam says also he could have thoughts of tshuva as well. You know, he read tshuva. What does that mean? If a person has thoughts about doing tshuva, it's considered to be like he's doing tshuva, sort of, you know, so, somewhat. Even though he didn't actually physically yet complete the whole process, but because he's thinking about it, that's already like also tshuva. Let's say a person does vidui, right? Abiti chatati pashati. So even though he didn't really do much right now, the fact that he did, you know, tshuva, he really means it in his heart. He really means it in his heart, you know? He really means it. Even though he didn't do nothing, he's considered to be now tzaddik. Why? Because he he really wants to do tshuva. He really means it. He's not just doing beating on his chest, you know, just for, for as, as a habit. You know what I mean? He, if he really means it, now he's considered to be tzaddik. So therefore, we're concerned that maybe this parent, you know, went to the Beit Knesset, he went to the shul, right? He, he did tshuva, he did vidu, he confessed to Hashem, and now he's not a Rasha anymore. So that, that's the reason why the Rambam says that a person has to respect his parents, even though they're Rasha. Comes the Tur and says, no, we're not concerned about that, right? Whatever he is now, that's what he is now. So there, and this, this machloket, this dispute was also in the Shulchan Ruch, right? According to Banana Shulchan Ruch, the Sfardim, he goes like the Rambam, that you have to respect your parents or Rasha. But according to Rama, who was the Sfar Ashkenazim, he says, no, if he's a Rasha, you don't have to respect him. Yeah. But the question is that, exactly, there's two different, different opinions about that. But the question is not like this, right? What about if he's even worse than that, right? Not only the Rasha, he's Mumar, right? Mumar, Mumaria, you know? Mumar Gaddafi, you know? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> what are these guys? <laughs> right? You know what Mumar means? Not only is Rasha, you know, Gas Gedulia, you know, Gakida or Tavis Tau, you know, like he's totally like, you know, Tasulia, Tasulia, you know, Kaidan Tasulia. George Soros. Okay, okay, you got me left to it, you got me the left to it. So, uh, so what does that mean, right? This means that he's doing one of the cardinal sins that removes a person from Judaism altogether, you know? Karet, he gets cut off, you know? What does that mean? No Shabbat. Right, adultery, homosexual, you know, things like this, or he's a kofer, doesn't believe, you know, he doesn't believe that the Torah is from Shemaim, he thinks that some person wrote it, you know, it's bad, man-made Torah, he doesn't believe in the Torah, kofer, yeah, apikoros, you know, that, that, all these kinds of things, this is considered to be like deal-breakers, these things, you know what I mean? What? So for a person, yeah. What if he doesn't know better? We talked about that. Last that's time. something, yeah, we're going to talk about that also, we'll talk about that. Yeah. That's also part of the equation, because today that's exactly what it is, you know? Uh, but the thing is, he's in a hurry. Okay, we got we got to finish. We got we got we got we got we got to wrap it up. We got to wrap it up. So the idea is like this over time: that when it comes to a person like this, there are people who say, even though the Rambam says, right, the person is Rasha, you have to honor him. But when it comes to these cardinal sins, that's already like not not included in this category, not included. You know why? Because it can still be like a goy, this person. You know, like a goy is living. Living is like like a goy. So we have to honor a goy, right? This kind of thing. You understand? And there are some who say that because today in our generation. The people don't know what they're doing. So therefore, even a parent like this, you should honor him, you know, even though he's not keeping Shabbat, even though he's not keeping these cardinal, you know, sins he's doing, all kinds of things. Anyway, you should honor him. You know why? Because in this generation, people don't know what they're doing. Tinok Shanishba, you know? That's that's the idea. So, But you know what the, the interesting thing is? The point here to make is like this. Nevertheless, right, either way, we have what to rely on, either side. Right? The truth is, right, if a person wants to say, listen, you know, my parent, my, my father doesn't keep Shabbat, I don't want to honor him. He has what to rely on to do that, you know. But one thing he has to be careful. What does what does that mean? Even though you, you you could you could get away with not honoring him, but not to disgrace him, not to cause him suffering, you know. 
to disgrace your parents, you know, to, to give them, you know, tsarot, you know, gagijos, you know, you know, by doing all kinds of things, all kinds of behavior, which make your parents suffer, you know, embarrassing them, disgracing them in public, giving them a bad name, you know, all kinds of things like this, or, you know, mistreating them, you know, tre- treating them, you know, in a vulgar manner, speaking to them, you know, like, you know, you know, old man, you know, what do you want, old man, you know, leave me alone, you know, all kinds of things like this. All kinds of, you know, disrespectful. So for a person, you see the things like this, right? That the poskim stress this point, that even if you are in a situation where you're not obligated to honor your parents, because your parents are mechalal Shabbat, they don't keep Shabbat, all kinds of things like this, nevertheless, you're not allowed to disgrace them. You know, don't cause them suffering. What's the difference? When a person has to honor, he has to do all kinds of things for them. You know, bring them this, bring them that, to take care of their needs. That's called honor. But even though you don't, you don't want to do that, but nevertheless, right, don't disgrace your parents. And a lot of people, by the way, fall into this problem, you know. They, respect, they disrespect their parents, speaking chutzpah, you know, yelling at them, screaming, insulting them, you know, denigrating them, all kinds of things like this. They say, right, that a person gets punished very greatly for these kinds of things, you know. That you cause your parents this kind of disgrace and shame, you know, all kinds of things like this, not behaving properly, giving them a bad name, a bad reputation, all kinds of, a person does these kinds of things, they say, oh, well, he's going to suffer very greatly in his life, you know, very, very greatly, because nothing nothing makes a person suffer more than than the, disgracing his parents like this. This is considered to be like, you know, something which is a deal breaker, you understand? So a person has to be very, very careful how he treats his parents. Swallow your pride, man, you know, like, don't try to, you know, answer them back, you know, and re- insult them back, you know, you know, you know, who are you talking to, you know, you're talking to your parents, you know, this is not your friend. You should know who you're talking to, you know. I you have to, I you know. My father would say, You remember Osipov. He would be walking down the, the living room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for coming, guys. God bless you. Derek Shalom. All the blessings to you and your family. Amen. So God bless you. God bless you. Offer you can refuse. You know, it's a garment.